Can you speak into it? All right, let's pray. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Living Web Farms webinar on electric tractor conversion. My name is Richard Freudenberger. I'm the uh, energy uh, resource coordinator here at Living Web. And uh, we took upon ourselves a project, uh, actually started a year or so ago, on converting a cultivating tractor to electric power. And the um, Benefits of that are several, and you know I'll get into that in a second. But you can see uh, here that we're actually using it. Uh, it's a cultivating tractor. It was uh, designed. The original one was designed and built in the early 50s, and since that point there have been a number of um, internations or uh, versions of of the original tractor by different companies. So there's really three of them, but I'll move on to ours here at our North Farm. Uh, it's in this picture here. It's um, the rear wheels have been narrow, or they are narrow. They haven't been spread out yet to fit the rows, but it gives you an idea of how flexible these things are. They um, allow you to see a, a real um, clear view of the cultivating area, right? You know, right down there at the bottom of your feet, and you sit in the seat, and you're. Everything happens right between the front and the back wheels, so it makes it, um, you know, fairly convenient. And the other thing is the um, the tractors themselves are not all that uncommon. They made about thirty thousand of them in the early fifties, and then uh, I'm not really sure how many they made in the uh, in the late seventies or mid, I guess early seventies through through the mid eighties. They uh, another a company manufactured very similar ones and I'll show you pictures of that. Um, so there's really they're out there and the and the the issues mostly are that the engines uh, are more difficult to get parts for or they get expensive or whatever but the the actual tractor the frame the um, the, the tires the wheels the drive systems the bearings all all the other important stuff besides the engine is readily available at the parts stores they're not that expensive uh, no more so than anything else in another type of a tractor. In fact, owing to the size of this thing, it's only about, thir this particular one's about 1,320 pounds. So, um, you know, it's not like a huge tractor, so the parts are really not that overly large and they're not that expensive. Uh, as you can see here, we, um, we are uh, use it as a cultivator. It's, right now it's just rolling along, but uh, it has a three-speed transmission, and of course we have a speed control in the motor as well. So it's really not that all that different from driving um, a regular a regular tractor. Um, the, as I said, the cultivating tractors are very simple in their design. Uh, they're really the frames are sort of up in the air. It's like a big uh, a big loop or a or a curve. And the engine is in the rear, and the uh, steering, of course, is in the front. And the lift mechanism usually operates from the front, and it can lift um, a number of things here. Um, besides a cultivating bar, uh, you could put other tools on the toolbar. You could also um, install a um, uh, finish mower or a bush hog to fit to fit the unit. Um, 
the uh, axles are adjustable. As I said, they, they will go out to full width or they'll come in narrow uh, if you need to. And you know, the weight, it's not like a, it's not like a garden tractor where it's only four or 500 pounds. This is a, this is a minimum of a 1,200 pound tractor, maybe up to over, a little over 1,400, depending on how you, um, how you outfit it and who makes it and also how many batteries you put in it. Um, even, even when it was out of the factory in a gasoline version, it, they weighed somewhere between 12 and 1,400 pounds. So this is the original Alice G model. Uh, this particular one we have is a 1954. Um, actually, I think, believe it's about 11 horsepower, believe it or not. Uh, an old Continental engine on it. We use it for trimming, for mowing, basically. So everything works. Um, again, parts for this thing can get a little expensive or a little hard to get. So that was one of the reasons we um, decided to make the conversion on this type of tractor. This particular one, the Alice G, is... Um, is functioning and working, so we, you know, it, it got it to work, so uh, it's it's fine now. Um, so we didn't really want to convert that one to electric because it's sort of a, a nice classic uh, old tractor that has some value. So um, and everything was there and everything, you know, pretty much was working. So uh, we didn't want to distress that one too much. But um, this one is at some point in the early 70s, a manufacturer basically took up the um, took up the banner of the Alice Chalmers tractor and developed their own uh, cultivating tractor. Uh, it's called the Tri Tractor Manufacturing Company out of, um, I believe it was out of uh, Cummings, Georgia. And I don't really know the year of the tractor. This is, I'm going to say it's probably the mid, you know, the mid 1970s here. Um, and this is the one we actually did the, did the conversion on. So, um, you know, that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, this other one, we, ha we have three of them. The other one is um, uh, a tough built tractor, which is the actual name of the tractor. It, it, the company, the parent company is, is the uh, uh, tri-tractor, but the uh, tough built's the name of this particular tractor. I'm not sure of when in the scheme of things uh, this model appeared as opposed to the other model, but this particular one is powered by a, um, by a, um, Onan industrial engine, and when we got it, the the charging system was had been removed. Uh, there was no charging at all, so it would run for a little bit on the battery charge. But uh, what I did on this particular one, which has very little to do with this class, but uh, just by notice, this overhead um, canopy is a solar panel. So basically, we've replaced the um, charging system in the in the tractor with with solar charge and. The battery is strong enough that even if it rained all day, it would still carry it through um, through the day, and you wouldn't be working too much in the rain anyway. So um, that's that. Um, the um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on on the electrical design uh, stuff because it's it's so different for different motors, different um, battery capacities that you may choose. Uh, different control systems that you have an option to look at or use. Um, but there are some very essential and basic um, te technology terms and technological uh, theories that, that work. Um, and basically, what I can compare it to is, is a, a, an EV, an electric car, which there's enough of them out there now, the, you know, the Nissan Leaf, the, the um, uh, Tesla, uh, any many other uh, GM, Ford, uh, Toyota, whatever, all electric cars, and they basically measure their um, capacity when they're advertising in their specifications. They measure their uh, capacity in in, um, in kilowatt hours, but the battery capacity itself, when you are when you are shopping for batteries and you're looking at what you can actually fit into the machine, the battery capacity is measured in amp hours. And that basically one amp hour allows you one amp of current for one hour. Um, so the battery pack in this tractor is a, is a 140 amp hour battery pack and we're running it at 48 volts. Now the reason the, the 140 is actually fairly um, moderate or um, minimal, really, 
Uh, it, it would be nice if it was, it was quite a bit larger than that, but the whole reason for doing it this way is that, number one, these lead acid uh, absorbed glass mat batteries which we're using are recyclable. And that's any lead acid deep cycle battery is, they're very common, they're totally recyclable, and they're not that expensive when you look at comparing them to uh, lithium batteries or any other, any other uh, chemistry that's out there. Um, the other thing which is really important is the fact that in a car, your range is critical. I mean, you, people plan out where the charging station is, how many miles I can go, can I go 104 miles, can I go 160 miles? Uh, if you've got a, a more expensive EV, or can I go 230 miles, whatever. But once you're out of juice, you're out. Uh, with the tractor here, it's, it's a closed loop. We're right there. The, the charger is right in the barn. The, um, the, the, the rows are right outside the barn, and we've got um, you know, basically 1,000-foot rows or pretty close to that uh, in one part of the farm that we can work. And so um, the idea is that the, there's, a, there's actually a fuel gauge on the tractor, or I'm calling it a fuel gauge. It's a, a, vol a voltage meter that lets you know a uh, sort of state of charge. And you know, by looking at that, you know you get out there, depending on the kind of work you're doing, um, you can do so many hours of work and then you need to come back in and charge it. Um, at this point, at, well, the other thing is that it's, it makes it difficult, unlike in a car where you are driving pretty much on a, you know, it might be a flat road, it might be a little uphill, um, or you may live in an area that's mountainous and you know you've got ups and downs to deal with. With a tractor, it's, a, it's in the same spot, so you pretty much know what you know, what you're, where you're going, what you're doing, and the variables with that are going to be uh, things like um, the depth of the cultivator, the soil structure, the, um, uh, if you have the uh, uh, lift in the back, if there's weight, extra weight you're putting on, um, if you're doing other kinds of things that, that absorb more energy, you can expect that your range uh, or your mileage, if you want to put it that way, will be reduced sometimes significantly. So um, this, the tractor is not, by the standards of automobiles, it's not all that impressive, but it doesn't really have to be because we're trading off the cost of building it with the, basically a golf cart technology. With, uh, we're trading that off with um, the fact that uh, you know, we don't really need to go um, you know, 130 miles. I mean, uh, essentially the range on this tractor might be about uh, at the low end, it might be about 14 or 15. At the high end, it might be about 20, 23. And you can figure out, you know, if we're running 1,000-foot, you know, 1,000-foot know, runs. But again, that could, be, um, that could be changed by the amount of work that's being done. But um, you can do a, a calculation. Um, in, in hard work situation, it may last a, a couple of hours. It, uh, it, it probably will go up to maybe four hours. Uh, before needing to be charged again, uh, something like that. But again, the testing is still, there's still some weight testing and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of other kinds of uh, uh, benchmarks I want to add on here. Um, and maybe later in the, uh, on our website, livingwebfarms.org, I will post a, uh, in the, in the uh, handout section of our workshop, we have an archived handout section, I can post uh, some of the facts and figures uh, as as we develop, as things go, you know, further along, and we can get some get some uh, benchmarks as far as like depth of, you know, depth of the cultivators and the type of soil and how much work it's doing and how much uh, how far it goes and, and that kind of thing. Um, the uh, uh, energy itself is measured in kilowatt hours. Uh, amp hours is a capacity measurement, uh, but but work or energy is measured in um, in kilowatt hours. So our tractor here has um, a consumption of 6.72, or a, a, not a consumption, but a uh, uh, energy, energy availability of 6.72 kilowatt hours. That's our, that's our package. Uh, to put that in, into, into some kind of um, 
comparison where uh, a Nissan Leaf, uh, maybe the second generation Nissan Leaf, I think it's about 34 uh, kilowatt hour measurement. Um, some of the more costly cars can be um, up, you know, well higher than that. But of course, in like an SUV that may be that may be a um, an electric SUV, the the the, um, the weight, and then if there's four wheel drive, that's going to draw down uh, that's going to draw down the range considerably. So there there sort of has to be a larger package in there to uh, to make it function in a practical way. So an EV car. A, a typical EV car will travel about uh, about three to four miles per kilowatt hour, or maybe 0 0.29, 0 0.3 kilowatt hours per mile. So, um, again, this 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 could be an entire class just discussing the terminology and how we figure things out and whatever. Um, the uh, the point is, there's a lot of on the internet and in, in certain sites and EV hobbyists do it yourself kind of thing. There's a, a lot of calculators, uh, calculations and calculators online that will allow you to, um, you know, plug in your, what you can afford basically, or what your values, what your goals are. And then you can plug in and see what you need. If you'll be able to accomplish it based on the, um, the availability of the motor you choose and uh, the weight of the tractor and, and so forth. Um, so the motor selection is, uh, of course, important. And for these kind of vehicles, n not cars so much, but these kind of vehicles, uh, forklifts, um, golf carts, utility trucks, this tractor, um, anything that's more of a utility type vehicle, um, the most typical motor available is a series wound brushed DC motor. Everything I'm going to be talking about tonight is, is a DC or direct current motor because they are common and they're relatively in inexpensive in the scheme of things and they're very durable, um, robust motors that um, are, are difficult to overheat or damage or um, do things horrible to uh, in a short period of time that, um, you know, will cause you to have to replace it. Uh, the only, the only, uh, Bad thing about the, having a brushed motor, a motor with brushes, is that the um, the brushes do wear out, and over time they will wear out. And there is a, along with the wearing of the brushes, there will be a um, creation of you know carbon dust and and um, you know sort of a dusty uh, buildup of things. On the other hand, the tractor itself is in an environment of dust and and dirt and silt and silica and all that, so it it also um, you know, that, that factor works in. Um, there are a number of manufacturers of these, of these motors. Uh, a, just a simple search online will let you know, uh, basically, uh, used and new forklift batteries, uh, forklift uh, motors are, are fairly common uh, in surplus circles. Um, new motors, um, uh, advanced DC net gains, another, version of the advanced DC and just a, a host of other manufacturers make several varieties of um, and voltage ranges. This particular motor is um, is a 24, the range of its operating is it can take a 24 volt to 72 volt direct current input and um, you know that's um, you know that's a, a wide swath of availability there so we're running ours at uh, 48 volts. The higher the voltage the more efficient the operation is, it could be run at 24, it could be run at 36, it could be run at 60, um, and that also will depend on the um, the uh, fitting of the batteries. Really, the physical ability um, of of you being able to fit a certain size battery into the space available, and also, of course, the cost. Um, the batteries that uh, I used in this one are as I said, they're um, deep cycle uh, AGM or absorbed glass mat batteries, and they will they ran for a 140 amp hour rating at 12 volts. They run um, they were running I think 360 dollars for the each battery, and then there was a shipping charge, so it came out to about 400 per battery. We have four of them, 
Um, they're very durable, very um, um, uh, tolerant, and uh, if, they're, if they're charged correctly and not drained down uh, below their limit, they will, um, they will last you know, quite a while. Uh, the other motor that we can discuss is the permanent magnet DC motor, and that, that the field winding, the field of that motor is not a wound uh, network of wires, it's actually a permanent magnet. And um, these are a little less expensive than the series wound DC motors, and they're, um, they're, they're robust, but they're not quite as uh, durable as the, um, as the series wound DCs. They're, uh, they're a little lighter, um, they're a little less expensive, as I said, and um, they're, they're pretty much more available as well, except the, the problem is, maybe that's not a problem, it's for us it's not a problem because we're not using the horsepower, but for the most part these, these are, are available in watts or horsepower that is, um, say, under 10. I mean, I, I saw an 11 one the other day, I was looking at, at the price on an 11, 11 uh, um, kilowatt uh, motor. The, um, the smaller ones, basically the ones you see for bicycles, power bikes, and they're, you know, electric bikes are going to be 500 watts, 1,000 watts, um, you know, 1,200 watts, whatever. So 1,000 watts is one kilowatt. Uh, <clears throat> but they do make larger, um, um, larger horsepower or, or wattage uh, uh, permanent magnet DC motors. Um, and they will be less expensive than the heavy uh, type used in the forklifts and, and the electric vehicles and the golf carts. So um, uh, you can, if you're shopping and looking at motors, you can consider them. Um, the, the only other drawback, which I probably don't think you probably would, would run into because you'd have to really overload it, would be that excessive heat, both ambient, I mean a combination of ambient heat in the atmosphere and your, um, and just the, uh, Putting a load on the on the uh, motor, overloading the motor, uh, excessive heat can uh, damage um, or re pull the power out of the magnets. So uh, you don't want to do that. So um, that's you know it's one other it's one other uh, thing to remember. Um, so this is and I, it's really difficult to read, but it's basically every motor should have a uh, a performance chart. Um, they call it cold performance testing. This particular one is, is our motor at 36 volts. Uh, the chart for the 48 volt one was, was almost illegible, so I couldn't really use it. But the, um, I'm not really sure, my mouse doesn't work, but up here in the, in that point right about there, it's showing you that uh, at 2000 RPM, we're, we're generating about 6.1, maybe 6.4 horsepower. Um, and uh, quite a bit of torque, and for a tractor, torque is, you know, torque is really desirable. Um, now you might ask why the original tractor had um, 11 horsepower, or on the later models they were say 16 horsepower, and I'm only getting away with six and a half or six on this one. It's because that is because of the torque. The 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 series wound uh, DC motor has a incredible incredibly high amount of starting torque, and, and that does not hold true for gasoline engines. A gasoline engine has its, uh, has its torque generally built into a mid-range, um, higher, much higher RPM area, and, um, you know, of course, that, that's fuel consumption, and that's noise, and that's a lot of other things we don't really need. The electric motor, we can pretty much get, you know, get by at a, um, at a, real, a fairly low RPM, and and still generate quite a bit of torque for pulling, and you know dragging, pulling, digging, whatever you know whatever we want, and especially if the tractor's loaded with um, you know heavier batteries like these like these lead acid uh, absorbed glass mat batteries are. Each each of these batteries weighs 95 pounds, so you can imagine you know we've got 400 pounds of batteries on there plus the additional auxiliary battery which is smaller um, that I put in for the uh, the lift and some of the other stuff if, if we ever put lights on it or anything like that. So um, the, if you do go shopping for motors, I would, I would definitely uh, look at, um, see if you get a hold of the, 
spec sheet data sheets on these power curves and performance curves. So you can take a look at it, and um, uh, they're pretty much self-explanatory. If you you know pick a pick a spot there and read each of these, uh, you know efficiency and uh, power, horsepower and RPM and uh, whatever else is on here, and um, you know you can get an idea of what you may need or want uh, before you actually make your purchase. Um, travel speeds, and I know you can't see that. I'm sorry. I tried to I tried to blow it up, but what I did was to calculate the uh, travel speeds at, in each gear of the tractor. Um, in a little bit, I'll explain why I chose to keep the transmission in the vehicle. Um, the, clutch is, the clutch has been removed, but the transmission stays in there, um, mainly because it fit better that way, but um, there's some other things too. But we uh, basically wanted to know in what gear, at what RPM, what engine RPM or motor RPM, uh, how fast, what your road speed is or your, or your walking speed is uh, on the ground, ground speed, uh, in each gear, because that's important for, you know, for cultivation, farming, and everything else. So we've got um, uh, three different RPMs on here, a 2,000, a 3,000, and a 4,000. Um, and really the 4,000, there's no need to run the motor up that, that high. It, 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 um, it will draw more amps, and uh, we never, with these, with these types of motors, you never want to have it in a neutral position or free from, uh, free from driving and rev the motor up because it could, uh, if it was left up like that way for you know for a period of time, it could fling the uh, the uh, internal parts uh, apart. So we don't want to do that. Um, you know, basically this motor can run at a nice thousand RPM and still have and still have plenty of power, or or two thousand and still have plenty of power to do what we want to do. I'm just going to have to look. I I can have to look on this one. I guess. At the at the at the uh, lowest speed in gear one, we're running about two and a half miles an hour, and in gear uh, gear three, we're running at eight point one two. It looks like, and in the middle of the second gear, we're running at four point seven nine miles an hour, and um, reverse gear is about two two point four. So um, I think the human walks about two and a half miles an hour, something like that. I may be wrong, but basically, I calculated all these by um, by um, basically jacking the tractor up, one wheel up of the tractor, and and spinning the input shaft of the transmission in each gear, and then counting. Maybe I spun the input shaft ten times and counting how far the wheel rotated, and then double check that with the um, tire specs. So you can, if you have a a, a twenty four by eight fifty tire, or whatever. On the tractor, it's it's stamped on the um, on the sidewall of the tire. Uh, you can look that up, and it will tell you how far, how many feet, the uh, in one revolution that tire makes. So, and that's for all tires, for cars, trucks, and tractors, and everything. So, you uh, basically by by uh, extrapolating and calculating um, at a thousand RPMs. If I if I spun the input shaft at 10 RPMs, I saw how far the wheel moved, and I marked it, and then um, I just multiply that up to 1,000 RPMs, and then, you know, use the chart from the manufacturer to realize I can go so many feet um, in, you know, in that 1,000 RPM, and then we just calculate that into uh, how many feet in, in how many minutes, and then we calculate that into miles per hour. Um, of course, then shift into second gear, and do the same thing again, and shift it into third, and do the same thing again, and and reverse, and do the same thing again, and just write all that down. So you just really know, you know what you're what you're looking at. Um, if the motor you have available to you is able to operate in conjunction with the transmission that you're using to um, to get the speeds, you know, realistic speeds that you want. It's not a critical thing, but you do want to be able to lug, you know, down fairly low at at two miles an hour, and you want to be able to, you know, move drive along just at road speed, uh, you know, at, at something a little faster, like uh, I think we've got, uh, oh, I don't know what we've got about here, about 16, 16 miles an hour at the top, at the top end, which I wouldn't do. It's just, uh, that's, that's at 4,000 RPM, but that's, it's available. So, 
um, battery selection. And I will be going over, um, we'll have, I'll show individual uh, photos of these things. And, uh, you know, unfortunately we can't drag the tractor in here to the studio, but uh, I have photos of things and short videos of things, and I'll be able to discuss it in detail um, uh, when we get to those points. But, you know, the battery selection is probably the, probably even more important than the motor because you can, you can pretty much have a lot of leeway with motors as far as output and uh, and uh, weight and all that kind of thing. But uh, batteries are are going to be um, the expensive part, and that's you know that's something that we really need to look at. So, you know, people probably want to know why we didn't use the lithium batteries. Well, for the you know for the most part, it's just really the expense. Lithium batteries are you know, quite costly. Not that they're not worth it for certain applications, but in, in this particular conversion, I really wanted to do it, you know, bare bones, old school, um, common technology kind of thing that most people could afford. That was, that was really the goal. If we, if we built something too high tech, um, AC motors, lithium batteries and all that, um, most people aren't going to be able to replicate that. I'm really, we're really trying to get people to possibly duplicate this. And again, you know, this is not just, this isn't the only tractor that you can do this with. I mean, you, uh, at the end of the, of the presentation, I'll show one or two other, other types of tractors that people are working on currently. And it's also um, in my, you know, some of my poking around looking at this, there's been, um, uh, people have converted um, walking tractors, you know, the David Bradley style walking tractors are kind of, um, other moder more modern, uh, normally diesel-powered walking tractors, they, they can all be converted to, uh, to electric and, um, you know, a lot quieter, basically. Um, charge it up, you know, take it out again. Um, quieter, no pollution, no, no thumping. Uh, you know, so there is a, there is a definite benefit. Um, so just to give you an idea of comparison, I checked the cost of our batteries. I said it was uh, basically $359 for 140 amp hours. That same <clears throat> price in a lithium battery was the I I fell upon one was eight hundred and fifty bucks. Uh, another one was eleven hundred and twenty bucks. Um, you know, just isn't there's really not a reason um, at, in this particular conversion to, to make it that expensive. So it basically went with what the golf carts are using. Um, and they, by the way, they're also not all using or don't need to be using uh, absorbed glass mat batteries. You can use, you could use trolling batteries, you know, marine trolling batteries. They're not all absorbed glass mat. They're just lead, lead acid deep cycle batteries. And the difference between a deep cycle battery and a normal battery is that most, uh, all car batteries are starting batteries. Uh, so they're really meant to discharge deeply for a very brief period and then charge back up again quickly. They were not meant to uh, discharge over a long haul, the internal um, internal structure was not made to, to take that kind of um, uh, function. And they also, when they get, when they get discharged deeply, they will uh, damage, it will damage their plate structure and the, and the, the uh, frames and the mechanism that holds the, holds the internal plates in place. So that's the reason we would go with a deep cycle battery, which is made to, um, to take the, that kind of, uh, it's not really abuse if you're not abusing it, but it, but it, in, in the world of batteries, it is sort of abusive to it. And the absorbed glass mat feature is basically even one step above. So it, it essentially makes it easier for the battery to pull down to uh, below 50% of its total capacity. Most batteries you'll, you'll see when you're, when you're shopping online or, or if you have a, you go to a battery shop that has a good selection. Um, you know, most batteries are designed, most deep cycle batteries are designed to pull down to 50% of their capacity. And you can go below, below that. And in fact, some, some chemistries and some manufacturers, you know, maybe don't, don't encourage you to do that, but they, they can pull down to about 20% um, of the capacity. So if you had, if you had uh, a thousand amp hour battery, um, you would normally be wanting to charge it at about you know 500 amp hours, but you could you could wait and keep on using it and charge it at say 200 amp hours, 
for a thousand amp hour battery. So that's 20%. Um, if you pull it down below that, you'll just reduce the life cycle of the batteries. Now, that's another thing is to look for is that in the spec sheets of the, um, of, you know, all the manufacturers, there's going to be um, somewhere it'll say how many cycles it's expected to last in its lifetime. So you'll see, you know, 500 cycles, 800 cycles, 1,000. You know, what I'm looking for here for these batteries is, is you know, well over 1,000, um, maybe 1,500, maybe a little more if they're taken care of. Um, and again, that will, that could be increased by drawing down, you know, to uh, more or not down below 50 or maybe down to only 60%, um, as long as you, and it will be shortened, of course, if you pull it down to say 30% all the time, it, that, that number, that 1500 cycle number will reduce, you know, significantly in some cases. Other chemistries like lithium and some of the other iron and other, other battery chemistries are designed, um, you know, like NICAD batteries and uh, some other ones are designed to um, to have cycles that, you know, far exceed 1,000. It could be over two, well over 2,000. Uh, but there's other features in batteries that, that don't really have to do with us in this conversion, but there may be features like how long a battery can sit, how many, how many days or months a battery can sit fully charged before it gets discharged, and how deeply discharged the battery does get over a certain number of weeks, and also the charging, um, not only the charging rate, but the charging management is critical in some batteries. Like with lithium batteries, there's a battery management system that has to be employed, or else you can severely damage the battery, or you could even possibly uh, start a fire. And that's why the, the BMS or the battery management system is, is, is critical to those batteries. And, we, you know, we have to be careful to match the batteries up with the BMS to, you know, make sure they're charging at the correct rate and, uh, and uh, not overcharging, not undercharging, um, you know, that kind of thing. So the, you know, the benefits of the lead acid AGM, again, are, are in the big world of things, or, you know, cost. Um, they're, they're, um, they're all deep cycle designs. I mean, I, uh, I can't think of one that isn't a deep cycle, but there could be, I guess. Um, they are, this is important, they are extremely resistant to vibration. And on the tractor, this, a tractor, any tractor, is going to be a lot of vibration. Um, you know, going over turf, going over soil, going over bumpy ground, and you know all the things a tractor does in his in his daily work. Um, so the the ability of the battery to just resist vibration is going to be you know, crucial. Um, they're also sealed uh, and spill proof. I mean, they uh, they're uh, valve regulated lead acid batteries. That's the VRLA that's on the chart there. Um, that means they can be sealed, and you don't have to worry about uh, excessive outgassing or filling them up again or any of that stuff. They're essentially no maintenance batteries or maintenance free batteries. Um, you know, that doesn't, that, that doesn't preclude that you have to be, be careful or be um, consistent in charging them correctly and on time and, and properly. But, uh, but, you know, other than that, they are maintenance free. Um, they also have a low self discharge, as I said, before, you know, just sitting there, not doing any work, you know, they'll last quite a while without, um, they will drop, but they will last quite a while and give you quite a bit of work, even though, even after sitting for a month or so. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's important. Um, obviously, you should remember and, and charge the machine up before um, you take it out on its first, you know, spring run or whatever. But, um, you know, that's a, that's just something to, uh, you know, to keep in mind. They're also low temperature tolerant. Uh, some batteries are do not. Some batteries are are difficult at high temperatures. Some batteries are difficult at low temperatures. A lot of them are. Um, this is fairly low temperature tolerance. So um, in the barn or whatever, when it's being um, you know being stored for the winter, it's not really a, a critical a critical thing. Um, and there's there's a lot of manufacturers of um, of AGM batteries. So you have a little bit of competition there. You can look at the you know the um, at the manufacturer's uh, spread of prices. We also have uh, other factors to take into consideration are the physical size. The physical size in comparison to the amp hour um, capacity. So, um, you know, if you're getting a small battery with a very high 
amp hour capacity, that's, you know, that's wonderful. If you have a very large, heavy battery and the amp hour capacity isn't, isn't all that great, um, that's not so good. And again, you know, fitting a block of plastic and lead case into a box is going to take a little bit of geometry. You have to figure things out, uh, you know, turn it this way, turn it that way, shove it forward, pull it back. Um, can you stack them one on top of the other, make a little shelf? Can you, um, you know, turn two in one direction, three in the other direction, all that kind of thing. It's a matter of um, spec basically arranging furniture and a floor, pl floor plan. Uh, but, you know, the, the point to look for is to, try to, is to try to get the highest amp hour capacity in the smallest package you can, but also look at your cost benefit for that. Um, if it's extremely expensive, you know, getting up into into a you know fairly high rate uh, per uh, amp hour capacity, you, you could possibly look at look at lithium batteries in that in that case. Um, which I, again, I'm not going to get into that in this in this discussion. But uh, they're they're not all. Oh, it doesn't ch the motor doesn't care what uh, you know what the um, battery chemistry is. Um, the other option, which really isn't, isn't as widespread and isn't particularly um, uh, that much of a cost savings, would be the lead acid gel batteries. And these, these do not use a fiberglass mat internally. They, use a, they just use a paste, a silica paste, which, uh, which fills in. That's basically uh, the electrolyte is, is, is a, a gel. And they're the kind, you often see them on um, power wheelchairs and um, other types of of equipment that might, uh, you know, might be bounced around a lot or turned, you know, packed sideways or whatever. They just they just don't spill. So um, you know they're uh, good for that. Uh, you'll see that in um, like on aircraft uh, flights. You know, you might want to uh, have to have that for um, when they're in storage that they're not going to leak. Um, so they they are also tolerant to a very deep discharge. You know, they are also sp sealed and spill proof. Um, and they're the same valve regulated technology, so they're, they're maintenance free or no maintenance. They can be a little more expensive, um, especially when you get up into the larger ones. So you're comparing in size anyway, in capacity, you're comparing apples to apples. Uh, when you're looking at two batteries, one being an AGM and one being a gel, I can say the gel could be a little more expensive for the same capacity. Um, and the other thing is, on a volume basis, there's going to be probably less capacity with, for the same cubic inch physical size of the battery. There's going to be less uh, amp hour capacity in the, uh, in the uh, gel battery than there is in the absorbed glass matte battery. So, you know, these are things to be aware of. Um, okay, I'm going to run through some of the components here. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to go into that uh, in uh, more detail later when we show the individual uh, pictures of them. But I just wanted people to know, and then uh, when they, um, when they uh, if you look at the video later, you can, you can actually have it here and print off the sheets. But this is essentially it. I mean, there's, I don't really count them. There's probably 15, well, probably more than that, but uh, there's a, several major parts, and then some of this other stuff is, you know, they're, they're necessary, but they're not uh, critically expensive or hard to get or anything like that. Basically, we have our, you know, our series wound motor. So that's going to be 24 to 72 volts. Um, the uh, range in watts is going to be somewhere between 3,500 and 4,500. It could be 3,000 watts uh, or 3 kilowatts, 4.5 kilowatts, you know, whatever it might be. Um, this is going to dictate, uh, depending on the voltage you put into it, this is going to dictate the, um, the uh, horsepower of the, of the end result of the motor. So that's, you know, that's that. Uh, there, um, I, I looked after we, after I purchased some of the parts, I actually went on, I waited a while, went online um, several months later and looked around just to make a, a little list of who these things might be available. eBay and Amazon, of course, have, you know, have um, a range of options. I've seen that. I, you know, usually prefer to buy from independent people, um, small businesses if we can. So we've got, uh, there are just a number of 
online stores the people sell components for electric cars and uh and boats that's another big thing motorbikes um i would say that boats cars the tractors utility trucks you know truck type vehicles and construction type things or uh things wheelbarrows maybe uh, or maybe large you know large utility uh, mule kind of things um that's one supplier and then you're going to get the e-bike suppliers that's like a sort of a different kind of supplier but uh but there's some crossover there but you cannot put a um 40 uh, 47 pound um dc series one motor on a on a bicycle it's just just too much so um but i was surprised to look i found at least five you know very well organized very legitimate looking um sites that had um you know a good history of uh, sales and and um you know reviews and looking at the um, looking at the kind of things they had for sale beyond the motors i mean there was you know all the other parts that i've listed here on the uh, down the list here you know they're all available as well through most of the suppliers so it shows that they're in business for the long haul and they you know they want to they want to serve and help you um of course sell stuff to you too but i mean it's it's um uh maybe maybe some place like an ebay or somebody has on craigslist or something may have a used forklift motor or just a motor that they purchased for a project and it didn't work out for them or whatever that's and that's perfectly okay um but i want everybody to know that there are as i said there are several online availability uh, stores of availability that have you know probably pretty much almost everything you want so besides the motor there's the next thing is is the controller and the controller is some people call the controller the throttle which is true to some extent there's a there's a little potentiometer box or they call it a pot box that that when it is moved with your hand when you when you make it go from zero to 100 percent that's linked into the controller so the controller is really sort of the brain um the computer so ma- it's the manager basically it 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 manages the speed of the tractor given the input it's it's given so um as you um it's running on you know it's running on 48 volts but as you change the amperage if you if you give it more it's going to sort of micromanage everything depending on you know the speed you're at the rpm the motor is so um the controller is a very very important um important piece of equipment and it's probably what uh the one area here i i got probably more than we needed it's a 400 amp uh 28 to 48 volt input 400 amps is you know quite a bit of amperage for for this you know this machine here um the reason i did that was because the 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 slightly additional cost on that on that particular controller gave me some peace of mind that it wasn't going to um you know get overtaxed overheated um you know theoretically if the controller goes bad there could be um a either a complete shut off function or a complete you know throttle function which you know totally unacceptable and there's other there's other uh, safeguards that I've built into here to make sure that doesn't happen but um but the controller is an area that um you know that I think is uh, is well worth you know spending what you can on it um I'm going to excuse me for not remembering what the prices on these things are but the uh the controller is running about $475 um on that so it's really the cost of a of a good battery um again I think I think the smaller one might have been you know 350 or something so the different the different cost levels uh, were worth it as far as I was concerned contactor is another part and I will show you all this uh in you know in the pictures but contactor is basically a relay in the elect in the EV world they call it a contactor it's just a relay and a relay allows you to use a very small amount of current or a circuit with a small amount of current to control a very large amount of current so we don't want um you know 150 200 amps going through the ignition switch or some of the more delicate you know the gauges and things like that it's just way too much power to go through so what we do is control the switch and the contactor is basically the ignition turns on the ignition for you so a key switch that's running on 12 volts turns on this uh larger 150 amp 48 volt uh on switch so that again is uh 
you know, that's an important part. And um, that is not all that expensive. I don't, let me see, I have to look at my notes again for that. I think it might have been $100. Uh, no, yeah, 90 bucks for that one. Um, so that's, you know, that's an investment, small investment. The shunt, the shunt is a, uh, it sort of looks like a, 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 a fuse, but a shunt is, a, is a, a strap or a strip that's bolted into the circuit, into the heavy gauge welding cable circuit that um, allows you to uh, borrow a small amount of current off of it to be able to read um, your instrument. So we have a little uh, ammeter from zero to 200 uh, range ammeter that, um, that I, I need. You have to be able to look at it while you're, while you're moving or you know, every once in a while anyway. Um, and if all if full current went through there, the ammeter would have to be, you know, very robust and very expensive. So these these little ammeters can basically borrow or or um, piggyback off of the uh, off of the shunt and allows it to work without a whole lot of current going through it. And I also put a little two amp fuse, just a little a little insignificant fuse in in that circuit as well. So uh, so if anything surged or whatever, it wouldn't necessarily burn up the ammeter the meter itself. Um, the power fuse, that's sort of a safety fuse within the circuit. Looks very much like the shunt, um, and you'll see that. It's a 250 amp, ampere um, um, fuse, basically, that uh, is, is put in line so that if anything goes wrong, if anything, if it gets extremely overheated, if you um, maybe locked up the wheel, um, I don't know, if the, if the wheels fell in a ditch and the tractor got stuck and the wheel stopped moving and the and the motor got so hot it would it would pop the 250 amp fuse which is you know in the range of um, you know eleven dollars as opposed to burning up your um, burning up your motor or potentially you know possibly starting a fire uh, and again that's why we put fuses in this put redundant fuses in the circuit so you know we have um, you know protection against that kind of thing um, a potentiometer, or what we call a pot box, and that is just a just a lever-operated um, control unit that tells the controller, the little blue box, which I'll show you and I spoke about before, tells the controller what to do. It tells the controller we're putting in, um, I'm, I'm creeping along, I want to creep along here, I want to just get off of idle, and that sends a signal to the controller that that's all we need, and then when I pull that thing back and get it to... Um, you know, get it to full throttle, uh, which again, with the electric tractor, you don't really need full throttle. I mean, that's just uh, a term that's sort of, you know, left over from the automotive uh, world. But um, then the the uh, potentiometer or the pot box will tell the control unit, where I want to go faster, I want to increase the RPM, and, um, and I'm sending you that signal. That pot box, by the way, is controlled by a, a, a uh, basically just like a lawnmower throttle, a little lever throttle that uh, you see on your regular mower, or riding mower, or whatever. Um, and I've connected it with a rod instead of a cable because it's more positive, more, more uh, robust than a, than a cable. Um, a DC to DC converter is what they call a step-down converter or in some terminology or some uses it's called a buck converter. Um, I, did not use a, I did not use a buck converter in this tractor because I needed something that would take the vibration and take and have a higher amperage rating because it's basically I'm using the converter as a, as a charger. Um, while it needs, we have a 48 volt system and I need to charge a 12 volt battery, my auxiliary battery. So the auxiliary battery runs the lift system and will run the um, the three-point hitch system in the back when that's completed, and we'll, if we put headlights on it, it will run that. Uh, it, um, it just runs a lower voltage circuit for the auxiliary stuff that, um, you know, that you might need. We have a fan, for example, a cooling fan, so that runs on 12 volts, um, the cooling fans for the uh, controller. Um, and any, any other things you could think of that you might want on, I mean, you could have a radio or something, I mean, whatever, but, but it, needs, um, it needs to be stepped down from 48 volts to 12 volts. And when I say 12, it's actually 13.6, but that's, that's just, uh, 12 is just a nominal number they use. Um, so that's, um, uh, that's a 500 watt uh, piece of equipment. And that basically 
is used in a lot of different applications. I mean, it's not just this tractor, but it's used for all sorts of power applications and power, uh, you know, power sources and whatever, where, where things have to be stepped down, like motor drives and, and whatever. And that's why we have um, that's why we have such a high amperage rating on it. I'm I know I could could have gotten away probably with a with a less expensive um, uh, uh, buck converter or step down converter uh, off of eBay or something, but I don't I wasn't sure it'd be able to take the vibration and the and the weather, you know, the moisture and the other stuff. None of this stuff is exposed directly to the weather, but you know, over time and parking and whatever, high humidity and whatever, it's you know, I just wanted to. This this one is totally water resistant, so you know, I made that choice. Uh, flip breaker, very inexpensive little uh, circuit breaker that you um, will. Uh, it's basically a fuse that can be reset, and that is that. This particular one operates at. When I bought it, it said 12 to 48 volts or 12 to 50 volts. When I got it, it said 12 to 42 volts, but it seems to be working, so it, it doesn't matter. It's basically um, in the circuit that that charges that operates the um, the step down converter, um, so that um, if anything happened with that circuit, I, I it, it really needs to be fused. I don't want it to um, burn up the converter, so. Uh, uh, you know, and replace an expensive part, so it just flips off, and then there's a res there's a flip it back on. There's a reset button and a, a testing button for it. So these things run. You know, I don't know what it costs, like sixteen dollars or something. So um, you know, that was a nice little a nice little addition. Um, the uh, battery is also the auxiliary battery is also tied into the other battery, the main battery bank, or the, what we call the traction battery bank. Uh, by a, uh, a little quick connector um, cable cable latching thing. And people may have seen these on, um, oh, if you have a golf cart, you've probably seen them. And if you have ever seen a forklift, an electric forklift in, in a big box store or at work or anything like that, they basically recharge heavy cables and they have these little plastic uh, plugs basically that mate, uh, you know, male to female and, and go snap together, they click together and they're, um, you know, solid, strong, uh, easily, um, and they're protective, by the way, when they're unplugged, they're, they're protective, so there's no, you can't stick your fingers in there or anything like that, so it's, um, you know, it's a good circuit. These little ones, this, this little one for the auxiliary battery is a small 50 amp one that's about the size of a, of a, um, you know, probably bigger, a little bit bigger than a small matchbox, I guess, I don't, I can't think of what, maybe like a, a pack of cigarettes, um, uh, Again, you know, just a disconnect and also makes it easier if we have to service anything. Just you don't have to unlug all the cables and weasel them all out of there. You can just unsnap the connector and you're done with it. Um, ammeter, as I said, is 0 to 200 um, gauge type. It's not an LED. This, this one I got was a gauge type. I let, prefer that better because you can look right at it and see where the needle is. Um, um, again, they, um, you know, it's just a two inch gizmo that fits in the fender or on the, it's on the fender on this box we made. Um, and that's, that's a important to tell you what kind of draw you're using because the higher draw you're using, the more, the less range you're going to get, um, the less hours you're going to get in driving or minutes or whatever. So um, it's good to keep an eye on that. The tractor will pull, you know, about 50, about 50 amps as we're going along. It'll, it'll do less than that. Um, in some gearing sequences, it can do about 70, and it will definitely go up to 200 if, if I thro full throttle it and, you know, want to climb a hill or whatever, but you try to avoid that. And again, that was one of the other reasons for choosing, leaving the transmission in, not just because it fit better, and the, the way I worked the motor out, it fit very nicely with the transmission in, but you can also use the gearing to micromanage your amperage draw given the amount of work you have to do. So uh, if there was no transmission, the only control you would have is the speed of the motor to deal with your work. Uh, this way I've got the speed of the motor plus the gear selector to choose whether I need to be in first gear or second or whatever and uh, keep, a, keep an eye on the ammeter, the gauge. It lets me know the minimum amount of energy or uh, capacity basically I need to pull out of that battery bank to, um, you know, to keep the tractor running for a longer period. Uh, fuel gauge, it's sort of a throwback again to the 
to the car world, but um, it's it's particular this in this particular case is pretty much hopelessly inaccurate, but it is basically designed to um, to indicate your state of charge. So it, it reads the voltage and, you know, a 48 volt system really we're running uh, fully charged, we're running about 51 point something volts, and, you know, pushing close to 52 volts. Um, but of course that, you know, that will pull down as, as you drive uh, over, over half an hour, an hour and more, and uh, we'll pull it down. Um, and the, the machine will still operate down at 48 and below 48, but, uh, you know, as we get down to a certain point, it just not, it's, it, it taxes the components within the system. It taxes the battery, it taxes the motor. So, you know, we try not to, you know, pull it down, you know, too low, but you can use the, use the fuel gauge or the state of charge indicator is a better word for it to sort of gauge your, um, your consumption. And um, again, it, it, it's not, this particular one I got is not particularly all that accurate but it's nice to have it there anyway I'd probably at some point maybe upgrade and see if it makes any difference but I won't do that until we've actually worked out a good a good testing sequence on the um, on full range and how many runs up and down the rows we can get and how many uh, hours and all that kind of thing at you know a certain cultivator depth um, the muffin fan the muffin fan uh, probably isn't necessary it's a cooling fan um, there was room for it and I wanted to put it in while it was you know, while it was still easy to work on and, and all that. So the muffin fan is 100, 100 CFM or cubic foot per minute, 12 volt DC fan. This aims straight at the controller. And uh, as when you click that, um, when you click that um, key on, the fan starts. Um, ideally, it would be set up to it with a, thermo, uh, a thermostatic um, uh, start so that when the controller got to a certain temperature, it would kick on, but I just, did not do that. It's only it's only drawing eight amps, fairly low draw, um, you know, very minimal. So I'm not too worried about it. Uh, again, in in some summertime testing, we'll take some readings on the temperature of the controller, and maybe just disconnect the fan altogether because it it probably doesn't need it. But it, you know, it's there, so we used it. Um, this is the rest of the components. The battery switch, basically a marine. A high current or high amperage, a 300 amp marine uh, application switch that is made for weather resistance. It's also made for um, turning off circuits in, you know, in, in in boats. So we have a it's a positive, manually operated positive fail uh, fail safe or you know goof proof means to disconnect the batteries completely from the um, everything else. So if something, if there was an emergency, if you needed to shut it off, if you get flustered and just have to shut it off, just reach it. It's on the, on the left-hand fender of the tractor, reach over, turn the knob and everything shut off. So that's, uh, that I consider to be extremely important because, you know, I, there are several, there are, you know, several people who would be using the tractor and not everybody, you know, is, uh, is going to be familiar with it or their learning curve may not, you know, may have to catch up. So this is something you tell them, you don't like anything about whatever happens, just turn that thing off and, and we can see what the problem is. Uh, cable control lever is basically a lawnmower control, as I said, a um, little, a little uh, uh, stamp sheet metal lever thing that, uh, that is designed to run, normally run a cable. I just wrap the cable up in a little loop to keep the resistance or the, the actual pressure, you can feel it. Uh, but I attached a solid shaft between the cable lever and the, um, and the uh, pot box so that it was a positive connection. And I have a picture of that. Um, the um, energy power transmission cables, all that's you know, critical. The larger the cable, the more efficient the system's gonna be. Um, I think some people are using, these golf carts generally use a, a two American wire gauge um, size. Uh, the higher the number, the thinner the cable. So uh, you may have seen a 12 gauge wire, American wire gauge is 12 gauge, 14 gauge, 16 gauge in your, in your plug, you know, your extension cords or whatever, they're gonna be generally 14 or 16 gauge. This is way at the heavier end. We're talking at, you know, four gauge, two gauge, one gauge. So 
essentially probably get away with a two gauge, but a step up in size to a one gauge wire. And the wire is actually a cable. It's a welding cable available at welding stores. You can order them online, cut the length. You can probably get them from uh, electrical, electrical supply house, whatever, where they cut to, cut to uh, size. So essentially we want a, a, a oil resistant um, one gauge cable that has a nice, a nice housing or plastic on it that, um, that again is oil resistant, heat resistant, um, thick enough to you know, take abuse and that's gonna be a welding cable. So uh, that welding cables deal with a lot of abuse. So that's what you're gonna be looking at. Um, you also, to make the connection at the ends of the cables, you cut the cable, you strip back the insulation housing and you have this little stub of an inch or three quarters of an inch, whatever, of pure bare copper wire. So a uh, barrel lug, they call it a barrel lug with a loop on the end or eye loop on the end, uh, gets, gets pushed over that bare copper um, extension on the end of the wire and then a, a clamp, a, uh, a, a clamping vise or a tool is used to, to crimp, it's a crimping tool, is used to crimp that copper barrel on the lug as tight as you can imagine and it, it clamps it on there and just won't come off. Um, so uh, we use, again, to match it up, we use a one gauge barrel lug and the lug hole sizes the ring, the part that it gets bolted to when you bolt down to where it's supposed to go is gonna be a, a 5 sixteenths inch size. They make 3 eighths, 1 quarter, 5 sixteenths in various sizes. So we use for our stuff 5 sixteenths, which is a very common size. Uh, we got another quick connector for the, for the main battery circuit. The batteries themselves, of course, uh, have to be able to be disconnected to service them. Um, so we have, a, we have a 175 amp quick connector. Again, it's a little bigger than the other one, but um, not, not too big. And um, th also the battery has to be able to disconnect so you can charge it. So you pull, you pull the rest of the tractor away from the, from the um, battery wires you pull the rest of the tractor's cable away from the battery wires, and then you have a cable to plug into to charge the battery. Uh, and of course, the battery charger has its own little uh, quick connector that fits your tractor so that you can do your charging. Um, the, uh, the traction batteries, I already explained to you about that. They're 140 amp, 12 volt, um, deep cycle batteries. Now, I've been asked before, when people look at the tractor, how come we're not using six volt batteries, which normally would be the choice in a car or something with a lot more space if you were building a pickup truck or a uh, or a car perhaps you would um the actually the construction of a six volt uh deep cycle battery is actually more stable and more um effective more efficient even slightly more efficient than the similar construction with a similar output of a 12 volt it's just the way a it's the way the uh voltage uh uh, requirements are stacked. So a six volt battery has three cells and a 12 volt battery has uh, six cells. And um, uh, just, just the physical construction of the battery within makes the six volt a, a better choice, but for, it's not that much of a better choice, it just is a better choice. But for, for our purposes, the 12 volt is what fit. The 12 volt is an excellent price on that particular 140 amp hour battery. Um, and they actually fit better than, I tried a different combinations of six volt ones, which really didn't fit in there all that well uh, without having to build a separate, another box, which I was, I already built another saddle box for the fourth battery. I didn't want to um, have to build another one on the other side because that would get in the way of the shift lever and some other things. So uh, essentially, um, um, you know, the batteries are what I described, the deep cycle, uh, 12 volt, 140 amp hour. The other battery, the auxiliary battery, is a uh, is again a 12 volt uh, smaller battery. It's only 34 amp hours. It's physically smaller, and um, it goes in a little tray on the uh, right side of the tractor uh, where it's exposed, but uh, it's protected from shorting and all that as well. So that's not um, you know that doesn't the the uh, amp hour rating on that isn't isn't that critical. I mean they probably get away with a 20 amp hour one on that one or spent more money and you got a 45 or 50, but there's no need. The 34 is physically the right size and it really doesn't do uh, a whole lot more than run the fan and operate the up and down uh, lift on the uh, hydraulic electric lift mechanism. 
for the uh, cultivator toolbar and for any you know um, any um, finish mower or anything that might fit on there. Um, battery charger. That's this particular one we use is a programmable style of 48 volt charger with 110 volt input. Uh, if I would have gotten 100, uh, 220 volt industrial style input, uh, it would have cost substantially more. That would that would be fine. Uh, that would be a, a good choice, but it is it is quite a bit more expensive. Um, we don't really need um, to do the lift of charging from 50% uh, up to up to a usable point. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't take all that long, uh, and we you know we just use 115 volt circuit in the in the barn for that. Um, it's a 25 amp battery charger, and when I say um, uh, programmable, uh, it's designed to be set for four different battery types. So you can use, you know, typical lead acid or gel or AGM or lithium ion or several other types. It just, it has a menu it runs through and you can select what you actually are using and then it, it um, adjusts for that, uh, for that particular battery and optimizes it for that battery. Also for safety reasons, like with the lithiums, um, you know, they're uh, sort of sensitive to the way they're charged. So, you know, it will manage all that. Um, obviously, we need a 48 volt charging input. It's, it's going to be over 50 to charge it. Um, that's how the way charging works. It's, it's a little higher than the actual circuit. Um, it's going to have to be 48 because we have a 48 volt system. And um, um, it's, it was designed originally as an onboard charger, but it doesn't matter. We just mount it on the wall in a little cradle um, and use it. Uh, I just didn't really want the weight uh, and didn't really have any place to put it in a clean way, you know, in a place that was sort of out of the way, so I didn't do it that way. We just stuck it on the, on the wall in the barn so we can charge there. Um, and the other stuff is miscellaneous. We've got a fuse holder. Um, uh, just a, there's several low, the 12 volt fuses for the fan and, uh, and the, uh, some of the other uh, circuits, the ammeter and some other things that uh, need the typical uh, ATC automotive type blade fuses. Um, 12 volt fuses, the box I think holds four. Ours might be six or four, I, I don't, uh, ours is four. But it doesn't matter if you if you if you don't need any more than two or three, you get a four. If you need more than four, get a six. Uh, it's just a little longer. Um, very inexpensive part. Um, some of them are waterproof or water resistant with covers. Some of them are just exposed. Uh, I used an exposed one, but protected it with a housing. So um, uh, I probably would have been better off with a with a one that has a little lid to it. But I I didn't have that at the moment. Um, and then a junction box, just a just a way to join wires into a central circuit and then take them out again so you don't have to have six feet of wire if you if you want to take a circuit to a certain point in the in the uh, control shelf underneath the batteries and then pick it up from there there may be there's a number of reasons for doing that one would be uh, main one would be to be able to disassemble the equipment easier you can just unscrew a screw and pull out 11 inches of wire out of a, a hole or a grommet instead of fishing out six feet of it. So, um, you know, the junction box is a nice thing to have. And if, if you, in your design work, when you're actually setting this stuff up, um, even just setting one in there, even if you don't use it immediately or setting a, a spot for it um, is a good idea. So that's all design work. Right. Um, well, I wanted to show you a little bit more of the tractor. This is the, this is the lift mechanism. You can see it's um, I'm not getting any sound on that, but maybe, I guess not, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can see it's, it's electro-hydraulic operated. You, uh, in the front, you'll see it in a picture. Um, but it, you know, it doesn't go up that fast. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, lowers itself and you, there's some micromanagement there. You can, you can see it's pressuring, so it's much deeper. Of course, until it moves, it's not going to dig in, but that's that. And that could be any number. I mean, you could put a disc on there, you could put, you know, any number of things on there, but you, you get the idea. Um, and, you know, this is it cultivating. I think I think I took a little shot here. Having a little trouble with the video earlier where it was freezing. I hope it, I hope it moves along. But um, you can see it's doing its work now. I set the depth. It's making quite a dig there. Um, and yeah, it's sort of 
hung up there, but you know, get the idea. It works. And there's, of course, there's one on the other side there too. So now I'll talk a little bit about the, go through the pictures and actually what I've done here. This is the tri-tractor to show you the manufacturer of this particular one. I'm going to guess this was probably in the, in the mid seventies sometime, I guess. Um, but you know, this is what that looks like. It's just a little, you may not have a, a label on yours, but uh, when you get by the time you get it, this is what it looked like when it came, when it came through. Um, basically, that piece of plywood up there, where am I here? That there, is um, basically a bulwark the the prior owner had just put up to shield himself from the gasoline motor behind there, and also mount the fuel tank. Um, this tractor had been used and modified quite a bit to suit the previous owner's needs for what he was doing. Um, we changed over the toolbar in the front and did some other things. But, you know, of course, the big changes were, you know, were in the drive system itself. So you've got two-cylinder, 16-horsepower engine that was originally in the tractor. It's in the rear, of course, and it drives forward. There's your lift bars, uh, your three-point hitch. It's actually a, well, it will be a three-point hitch when I get through with it, but it's, um, that can be electro-hydraulically controlled as well. Um, but, um, so the, you know, little, little tractor has, you know, can have all the implements and all the stuff you need. It's not, it's not an economy, uh, cheapskate thing. I mean, you can actually do it right if you, you know, if you want to. Um, so I want to show you what, so that you can see where the engine is and you can see here I've labeled the parts. So this is a, this is a strange machine because the manufacturer, when, when the, uh, tri tractor company designed this thing, they wanted it to be fairly flexible. Uh, speed wise and just in, in utility use. So it's basically is a lot of stuff going on here and it's a lot of efficiency being lost. And that's one of the reasons I used a 16 horsepower motor. So the motor drives an, a hydraulic pump it direct onto the front of the motor. There's a shaft, it drives a hydraulic pump. And then the hydraulic pump forces high pressure hydraulic fluid into a hydraulic motor through those hoses, um, the hoses, right? Would that be right there, right there? And then the uh, and then the hydraulic motor is linked to the front of the transmission, and the transmission has a three-speed selector, of course, just like like a three-speed manual transmission. So not only do you have your three-speed um, uh, gear selector to change the speeds to govern the speeds, but also the hydraulic pump is connected to a, th a throttle. Uh, there's a, a mechanism, but not only the throttle, but there's also a mechanism to control the um, speed of the fluid through the system. So there's really a lot of stuff going on there that you can make variable to suit your own particular needs. Um, all that came out. You don't really need any of that stuff. It just basically, all I left in was the, was the uh, transmission itself, which I've labeled there, um, you know, there, and it's up, it's up in there under all that stuff. So most of that came out. Um, so basically this is where the input, the motor was connected at this big red thing here. Uh, where is that? Right there. I can't point to it, but it's, um, that's where it was connected. Then it went on from there, but we don't need that. What we do need is a mechanism or a way to hold this, um, or connect this, uh, this electric motor. This is the output shaft or the nose part of the electric motor to the transmission and the transmission input shaft. This is not our transmission, but it's very similar to the one we use. It's, it's out, so it makes it easier to see. So basically, th that motor has to be connected to this thing, and this thing has splines on it. This is the input shaft. So essentially, we get a, um, in the upper uh, left-hand corner is the adapter that goes on the front of the motor. You can see that it has a little keyway and it has like a hub, and then um, the um, uh, upper right-hand corner is the is the hub on the motor. So it gets some some of the motors have spline shafts, some of them have um, set screws and this and the keyed shaft, which is like ours. So that gets firmly fixed on there, and um, and now we, now we have to adapt it to the. Uh, transmission part. So in the lower left-hand corner, there's a clutch from the tractor. And they're really not all that expensive. It's just the clutch mechanism. Uh, it comes with the hub and it comes with the clutch facings. And um, 
you know, it's a, uh, it might be a nine inch clutch, something like that. You can take that center hub and knock out those five um, uh, rivets there in the middle. You can see them there. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, you can see right in the center there around that center core that's splined. Knock out those rivets, drill them out, knock them out, and then you'll have just the hub, and then you can weld the hub onto the um, adapter that is on the motor. Um, the, in the lower right hand image there, there's a hub that has been welded onto there. If you're lucky, you can get a hub without buying the clutch. You can actually get the hub on, on some common um, conversion kits or common conversion um, models. There are hubs available for um, you know direct welding onto your onto your um, uh, part there. In this particular case, in the lower right, uh, that one has a um, what they call a Lovejoy coupling, which is a little bit gives a little bit of cushioning. Uh, our controller is so finite and it's controlled that it really doesn't need that. It doesn't slam into gear. So, um, you know, so it's uh, not that, you know, not that critical. Uh, we can take, a, we can take a break here. If you want to. Yeah. I was going to think at this point, folks, I've got after, um, I've got maybe take a five minute break and then we can, uh, we can proceed and I'll show you how to measure the depth and all the rest of the stuff on here. So, and your questions too, you can, if you have them.
Okay, I had a question on the board here from, uh, we'll just pick one here as Eric says, uh, it's just like the Alice G. Alice Chalmers G. Well, yes, it is just like the Alice Chalmers G. And I, in the beginning of the um, presentation, I explained that we, the Alice Chalmers G was, a, was an economy tractor that was sort of trying to bring farmers in somewhere between a walking tractor and a Ford 8N. Um, it's a four-wheel tractor and, uh, you know, it's on the light side, but still 1,200, 1,300 pounds. Um, and then that was in the early, in the early 50s. And, you know, I guess as the economy got better and people could afford, you know, more substantial tractors, it sort of faded out. But in the 70s, another company came up with um, a, a modified design like that with more modern equipment. And um, they basically did a knockoff of the Alice G. And, um, and there's several of those versions out there. So we have a lot to choose from. And there's, I, I believe I saw the production numbers on the original Alice, it's like 30,000 of them. And, you know, they're pretty solid. So they're really not going to, they're not going to rust in half and collapse into the field. They're still out there. Um, if anything's going to be bad, it's going to be the engines for the most part. So uh, um, we don't need the gasoline engine. So that's good. And the other ones, I don't know the I don't know the production numbers on the other ones, but they were um, you know substantial because the company you know stayed in business for quite a while. I think it I think it ceased. I think it lasted from the early 70s to the mid to late 80s. So you know they made some tractors. Um, but um, yeah, it's a it's an economy cultivating style tractor, which uh, is is actually not a bad thing. So that's you know most we had bought and we had purchased three of them in various states of disrepair, um, and you know in in the in the maintenance and fixing them up and figured we just convert one of them to electric and you know see how that goes. So before I was discussing the adapting the electric motor to the uh, to the uh, input shaft of the transmission. So we have a, a hub adapter that we welded up and that went from a splined uh, bore shaft, 5 eighths I believe it was, to a, uh, or from a smooth bore keyed shaft to a spline input shaft on the, on the uh, uh, transmission, which is actually from a, a small Willys, I think, a Willys Jeep from Lord knows when, but it was a long time ago. So that was that. Um, I wanna show you how, what we do, we have to fit this is the input shaft of the transmission. So the transmission's back a ways. It's, ba it's about six or eight inches to the right in that, in that photo. Um, but the shaft itself sticks forward quite a bit because it has to hold the clutch and, the, and there has to be a throw out bearing and some other mechanisms that let the gasoline engine do its work. Um, since we've stripped all that out, we don't need that, but we do need to be able to tighten the motor tight up against that, that red plate, uh, not so tight that it jams the shaft really hard against the transmission shaft because it's gonna wear the bearings out in both the motor and probably the transmission too. Um, and not so loose that it flops around and um, doesn't, we want to get as much surface contact area on, on that adapter as we can. So we really have to keep it you know, fairly, um, fairly tight or fairly accurate. So I basically used a, um, a um, caliper here to measure the distance out from the uh, face of that thing. And then we can adjust the, um, the welding and the cutting, whatever we need on that adapter to make it, to make it correct. I'm leaving a couple of thousands of, um, of free play uh, to allow for expansion or shifting back and forth, whatever. It can't be super, super tight. Um, so it has to be a little bit of little bit of play in there, but not not much, you know, three two three thousands or maybe a little more. So that's that. Um, then to to do the job, we actually take some steel plate, a square steel plate, a three eighths um, quarter inch or three eighths plate. I don't re remember. It doesn't particularly matter because you can put two or three of them or one of them. Or if you got a half inch plate, you might just be able to use one. We don't have the equipment we have in the shop is not so heavy duty that we can bore easily through half an inch or more. So basically we put two or three, uh, or actually put three together and made a pattern uh, off of the transmission face with a, you know, with a marker and you can see it in the next picture. Um, and then I match drilled. So basically put stacked together the, um, the sheets of metal that are gonna be holding the motor to the transmission. 
and then so the holes are all right exactly in line with each other. They're line bored with the drill press, and everything's clamped down so it's accurate. Um, you can see in this picture, so the result of that, we have the drawings, you know, we have all the uh, black marks there, the holes are all lined up. The big hole in the middle was made with a, with a uh, hole saw, metal, metal cutting hole saw, which you can get, um, you know, for this job, it's really, even for, even this one time, you'll probably use it again, but that, that size of a hole, I think it was really maybe $29 for that thing and a, and a big, you know, big uh, drill or a drill press. Um, and you can know, if you notice, there's a socket wrench on there. And the reason that is on there is because I've uh, used that to turn the, when I jacked the rear wheel up to determine how far, how fast it was going at walking speeds in each gear, I'd be able to turn that around by hand with a, with a breaker bar. So, you know, I'd put that little thing on there to be able to, you know, be able to do that. Um, so here's the end result. Um, well, it's not just a particular picture of it, but that's, you know, that's on there with three plates of metal and it's bolted in there. So um, actually the, the motor is 47 pounds. It doesn't need, doesn't need to be supported up front. We did that, not in this picture, but we did that. Um, essentially the motor gets bolted from the backside into the housing of the motor. Use some strong bolts on that. And once they're tight, the motor will stand up there by itself. It doesn't need to be supported. It did support anyway, but that's just sort of insurance. Um, let me see. You can see our, uh, the, our, the uh, box we made for the uh, to put weatherproof cover on the motor. The bottom is open, but the sides and the the rear and the and the front and everything on top are closed um, to um, you know to keep it off the weather. And Eli here is doing the uh, doing the leveling on it to make sure he he helped me with a lot of this stuff, a lot of the fabrication metal and um, and circuit too. I mean, you know, he's he's um, working in solar field at this point. Uh, so he's a great, great guy to have around and, um, you know, help me build this. Uh, then that is the control shelf. It's on to the next step. You know, the motor's mounted and we have it protected and all that. So now we're on to the next step is to, is to try to get the um, a box figured out and the and the sizing and all that for the um, you know for the battery uh, support what where that level is at that point um, that the batteries are going to go up from there this is the floor of the battery thing and then down here essentially is the what I'm calling the control shelf and you'll see that a little bit later um, but I want to keep everything level the battery should be level anyway I mean just really should be um, if they were flooded batteries, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, now the tractor will go up hills and down hills and stuff, but just, it's just nice to keep it level, keep everything square if you can. Um, that's sort of a almost completed box. So we have, the, we have the control shelf down here, and then we have the batteries fit on a plate up here. And you, if you notice it already positioned and figured out, beforehand where each part's going to go, like the controller, the, the uh, shunt here, and the, uh, the other part here, we've got the controller, it's going to go down there, we've got some other, tack welded some other, um, other blocks of, of uh, tubular steel on there to help support things up off the, the chassis of the, of, the, of the box because you may want to pass wires underneath there, uh, you may have to pass wires, cables and wires, you leave a little room under there. Um, to be able to route things through. So I was sort of thinking ahead. Uh, that's why everything's not flush mounted or anything, any component pretty much isn't going to be flush mounted. Um, there's a picture of the floor for the battery. It's a, it's a heavy gauge sheet, which I've cut, uh, tightly cut to fit so it slides out. So we can service, take the batteries out and service the, um, all the controls and anything in, in there by sliding out that piece of metal. Um, here it's sort of in position before we painted everything. So the control box, the controller is that blue thing uh, there. And then the, uh, to the left of that is the, um, the Elcon, the little, uh, little converter, the 48 to 12 volt converter, that uh, bigger silver thing. And then the contactor is that little black thing. And there's better pictures of it as we go on. Uh, the top of this thing, gets a cover, and I only have pictures of it when it's completed, but the top of this thing gets a cover, and it makes a really good shelf to, I mean, you could, you could put stuff on it, I mean, tools on it, it's, it's, it's well 
it's strong and it's well made and it's flat, so you can put all sorts of stuff on, the, on there, even your cell phone. So when you drive off, it'll it'll fall off. But other than that, um, you'll see it's just a, a good substantial box that uh, unstraps. There's four mounting uh, straps for it, so you can un undo that and um, and open everything up for maintenance and charging. It, it takes about 30 seconds. Um, here's Eli doing the. Uh, cable routing and the connectors of the cable. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner of the photograph or lower right-hand corner of the, uh, of, the, of the box, the control shelf itself, the red box, uh, the controller's there. And then the cables are being routed um, basically forward in the, in the center of the image there. There's a, the cables are actually going through the front wall of that, of that housing so it, to go on to do the connections they make uh, to the motor and, and that kind of thing. Um, the, he is preparing the ends of the cables for crimping for the lugs, and that's essentially that. There's our crimping tool. And these things can run, just a little, a little point here, these things can run um, several hundred dollars, and you can do that if you want. I mean, if, you, if you're going to be building these cars or tractors or whatever, or you're doing solar work or, you know, whatever, this machine, this particular crimper is made to go from an 8-gauge wire to a 1 uh, one O, which is the next size above the one, uh, one zero. Um, and, you know, I'm looking online and it's, it's $200, $179, $240. And I think that's nuts. And uh, making some calls to some of the solar installers to see if we could borrow one just for an afternoon. Ended up online and, and, and it's not, it's easy to find. There's a few of them that I think it was $32. And it has turned out to be an excellent tool. I mean, really not, it's well built. It worked every time, um, you know, I can't complain. So, um, so cheaper is not necessarily bad. And we can use this, you know, we've, we've used it for other things in the, in the farm too, so it's, um, it's nice. But basically, with all that leverage in the back and those blue handles, you just squeeze on them and it, and it super squishes the, the uh, copper um, barrel around the, around the cable inside and it won't come off. And then you, then you put that uh, round hole onto your stud and lock it down. And essentially that's sort of what it looks like when most of it's in there. I don't really see anything missing except for the batteries. Um, and of course the connections for the batteries. But you can see, um, you know, everything is neatly compiled down in there. And I labeled everything for you because I know I can't point with our new webinar um, set up here. It's, it's difficult for me to point accurately. So I've uh, just done that. And you can see all the all the important parts. We've got our DC converter, our our um, controller, the, the shunt and the fu the power fuse, the contactor, which is like the relay, um, and our um, I think I said the controller, and that little charger breaker on the right side is essentially um, just to uh, let the uh, charger have a have a way to pop a fuse if it has to. It's always a good safety measure. Um, there's a closer view of the um, uh, of the uh, charger. I'm calling it a charger. It's, ba it's basically a converter. It's a DC to DC converter, 48 volts to th actually 13.7 volt uh, DC circuit. So we can charge our auxiliary battery. In the upper right hand corner, you or upper upper left hand corner, you can see the uh, the junction box. Um, the power fuse is to the right of that in the sort of the center top of the picture. And that's, you can see those heavy cables going to it. The uh, fan is on the right side. And I'll have a better picture of that in a little bit. Um, and the contactor is right in the middle. And you can see, and I'll show you quite a close up of that. You can see why I said before the contactor is basically a relay. And the relay gets uh, the 12 volt circuit tells it what to do and it's an automatic switch that once it's told what to do by 12 volts it, it clicks and energizes the heavy amp uh, cables. So you can see here on the right side the little 12 volt control circuit wires and on the left side the big heavy one aught um, cable lugs that uh, basically the switch is turning on the entire power traction circuit for the tractor. Um, there's our, um, there's our power fuse there, uh, you know, it's a close-up of it. Um, essentially, it's just mounted on two little, or electrically on two studs, and then the whole thing's lifted off the, 
chassis of the of the box a little bit just to you know keep it off of um, off the surface and also you know, if there's any water condensing down there maybe or just something dripping or whatever it's not going to get into the components that's why you lift lift it off a little bit uh, on the right side of the of the control shelf there's the controller itself which I said is sort of the the, the brain of the throttle and tells the motor what to do and then above that uh, directly above that that little smaller quick disconnect uh, in gray that little thing that's sort of tilted to the uh, little angle where the uh, smaller cables coming out of and then right above that where the heavy cables are at the very top there the um, that's our shunt and you, if you notice those two little you've got two heavy cables coming in on the right and going out on the left or vice versa and then you've got the two pickups the two little uh, smaller I think you're probably 10 gauge wires going out to um, to the ammeter so it's basically just borrowing some of the reading off uh, and directing it to the ammeter so I can see what the amps are going through there um, but there's a close-up of it so you get the idea so the little wires are just pulling energy off the big circuit there's the fan picture I mentioned earlier it's the controllers at the top of the image or or behind the fan so the air is blowing directly from the front where the fan is intaking and then blowing it over the back um, the 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 controller is going to get warm or hot so or you know so it's drawing in from the cooler side of the box so that's what we're you know we're accomplishing here nothing on nothing on this other side here with the fan is going to get uh, is going to get um, particularly warm um, I've never felt the control box get hot but you know we'll, we'll give it a shot at some point in the summer and see see what's going on with it um, there's a little uh, inexpensive uh, flip breaker that I got a 40 amp the circuit is 50 amp I got a 40 amp um, some of these are sort of slow blow uh, they don't snap you know it takes a little bit of time for them to go which is you know sort of nice uh, what, you, what you don't want is the wire to catch on fire um, the, the fuse will blow before or the breaker will will release before the um, before the wire catches uh, gets hot <clears throat> there's the battery um, three batteries the battery the traction main battery uh, assembly there um, so it's positive to negative it's all uh, in series so it's hundred each battery has 140 amp hours um, each battery is 12 volts so if you link them positive negative positive negative it's going to put 12 volts all the way uh, through the um, through the um, circuit and and uh, will maintain our 140 amp hour um, uh, you know capacity and you if you notice I've labeled that one up here charge port uh, that one is charge port because that want people to know that's where you plug the charger in when you go to charge it the other one it's made it goes to the motor and and the controls and such so uh, when they're clipped together the tractor is functioning um, there's a little what I'm calling the saddle battery that's on the left side of the tractor down low under the seat the only place I could put it um, it um, it is good that it's up front there because actually we're a little bit back heavy a little tail heavy um, more more so than I thought uh, and um, you know it's a good thing that there's a cultivator on the front and some other stuff because I, I imagine if you are traveling fast and hit a bump without that on the front it, you know it could lift possibly lift the wheel up a little bit so you know that's not that's not a pleasant thought so uh, uh, you know try to keep the weight balanced as much as we can although it's good to have weight over the rear wheels in the tractor anyway um, there's a little box that we, we fabricated to uh, wrap the uh, the battery in because it's uh, it's you know 48 volt circuit and it's a you know high amperage we don't want it to be exposed particularly um, there it is in place so the battery just slips in there there's a hinge on the front of the box so we can slip the battery out again when we service it if it needs to be uh, serviced or replaced and then I'm going to sort of show you here if these videos work a little walk through um, the uh, battery box is here this is a saddle battery I hope it doesn't jam up on me um, we were having a little trouble before with it with the video but you can see a little cap comes off 
and the cables are connected and it just works out real well. And there's a view inside. Um, again, these don't have to be removed frequently at all. In fact, they really don't. I mean, they're maintenance free, so it doesn't matter. Take them out to replace them essentially. Um, that one, I think, I think a sort of a walkthrough on our, on our controls. That's the marine two position switch I talked about. That's our, that's our uh, fail safe disconnect between the batteries and the motor in case an emergency or anything you don't like about it, shut it off. These are the, there's the throttle and the shaft I have to control, uh, the little pot box, and then there's the ammeter on the top. The round gauge is the ammeter and the square gauge is a digital uh, fuel gauge, which essentially is reading the uh, state of charge on the batteries. Um, this is a close-up of the, um, that's not a video, this is a close-up of the, of the control um, system on the right side of the tractor. You can get an idea when I said I wrapped the cable that originally came with the throttle lever, sort of wrap it up in a loop because I like the resistance it gives. It's not, it doesn't make the throttle really easy to, you know you have to push the throttle forward and back and you feel it. Um, if I had snipped that cable off, it probably would have been too easy to do that. So, um, and we have an ignition key, of course, I forgot. That's a 12 volt key that goes directly to the contactor who fuses and it, um, and it energizes the 48 volt system. That's essentially it. Uh, it doesn't have a starter, like you don't turn it to the right all the way and it starts. It's just one click and it's on, back the click and it's off. Uh, there's, the, there's the little pot box with the potentiometer and you can see uh, that little lever, it's in its, it's in its off position. It, it's, it's made to snap back to, um, to off or zero. And then when you, when you shove it um, rearwards or to the left, it, it uh, increases um, energy to the, to the um, controller and then the controller takes it from there. So essentially a fairly important part of the system. It's also another, another safety. Uh, there's really two things that are gonna go wrong. If, if, and this is where you wanna make sure you spend, you know, don't, don't settle for, for something uh, mediocre. This thing, the, the potentiometer or the pot box and then the controller, as I said before. Um, you don't want energy, if, if the failure happens, you don't want it to fail at full speed. Not that the tractor's extremely fast, but you, you know, you maybe have a situation where you lose your head for a second, think, well, how do I stop this thing? Because there's no clutch. So basically you, you throw the throttle back to zero or, or neutral, but you know, if something's uh, broken, it's not gonna do anything. So that's why we have the, um, that's why we have that marine switch we can shut. You know, we can put it in neutral, the, sh the gear shift in neutral if we have to, or just shut the, uh, uh, shut the power off completely to the whole traction system. And it's, it, you know, that's the way to do it. That's why it's in a very uh, accessible position. Um, this is a very poor video of the fuse um, system. So the fuses for the, every 12 volt circuit that's fused is up in the top with a little, little fuse box, automotive ATC style fuses, the blade fuses, and then the ignition switch down below, uh, the connection there, and it's just, you know, basically a standard ignition switch, automotive DC style stuff. The battery charger, it's a 48 volt um, onboard charger, but I did not use it onboard. I didn't want to waste the space. It's also pretty heavy. Um, so made a little, um, Ryan, or another, Guy that used to work here made a nice little box here for it and mounted it to the wall. And um, we hooked up the, you can see the green <coughs> disconnect switch or disconnect, uh, quick disconnect housing at the top. Um, a little bit of electrical tape, whatever, but uh, that's, you know, just the way we had to do it. It's that, not that critical to be, um, it's, in a, it's in a shop, a shed, so it's not going to get walked on and stepped on and everything. So essentially that little, uh, that little red square in the uh, in the center of the of the charger itself is the menu LED menu, and it tells you to set in the beginning to set you up for whether you're using a um, you just push a button there. It's whether you're using um, a uh, gel battery, an AGM battery, a, lead, a lithium, a lead acid, whatever. You select that for the kind of battery you're using. And once you plug it in, it's it's on, and it will basically read a uh, uh, amber while it's charging, it, I think it reads a, 
or maybe read while it's charging, it reads an amber when it's uh, up to 80%, and then it uh, reads an, uh, green, I guess, when it's, um, when it's fully charged. And um, I would say that from a low charge there, I, it, it may take five hours, uh, but you know, for, for the kind of um, charging we need to do actually in, in the work situation, you know, an hour is going to is going to do it to bring it up to enough to be able to continue to work. So, you know, that's uh, that's that. Unfortunately, f these this is 115 volt plug in wall socket input, but these things are still um, fairly expensive. I, I've got because it's an industrial thing. I trying to remember what the charger is a $500 item. So, you know, not cheap. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted. That is and inverter, which um, is actually another really nice thing to be able to include with this package. Uh, in other words, it will allow you to take your tractor, a 48 volt tractor, drive it out to any corner of the field you want to, and plug in any piece of equipment, a drill, a light, a, um, you know, a saw, anything that you would normally plug in, power tool or, or pump or whatever, as long as it's uh, under 2,000 watts. This is a 2,000 watt, um, which is fairly substantial, 2,000 watt inverter. So it'll convert the 48 volt direct current to 115 volt user-friendly household current that you can plug anything into. Um, it's a marine um, piece of equipment, so it's made for it's made for the marine environment. It's made for vibration. It's made for you know getting moisture on, in and around it and all that. But uh, nice little addition. Um, and that gets plugged in when the when the lid, which is back, right behind that blue thing, I said the flat lid of the battery house. Uh, take that off, and you can plug the cable in the back of this thing uh, right to the into the battery side, and you get your power. So you know, again, um, not not necessary, not um, not part of the tractor itself, but it's a nice little tool to have. Um, of course, in these days of cordless tools, uh, it may not be as necessary, but there are things that um, that maybe that aren't that common, like cordless pumps or cordless other stuff that uh, requires more wattage. And this is, a, like I said, a 2,000 watt system, so it's you know pretty nice. And here we're coming to the end of a, end of the uh, presentation, but I wanted to show you um, another kind of a tractor. This fellow is uh, Ben Nelson in Wisconsin. He's um, online uh, on Facebook a lot with a lot of DIY stuff. Uh, in the electrical field. Uh, I met him years ago at a solar conference in, in Wisconsin, um, and we've, we've stayed in touch. But he has been um, uh, commissioned to take this 300 model, uh, older style um, international harvester and convert it uh, to electrical power. And, you know, I just took one picture with his permission, and I um, just wanted to show you that uh, for people who don't think the cultivator tractor is good enough for him, when this gets done, I'm sure Ben will be um, uh, promoting it quite a bit on, on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and, um, you know, he's taking it slowly but surely, but he's doing, I'm sure he's doing a great job because that's the kind of guy he is. Um, but, you know, there you can see the engine on the right side, the old engine, and he's sort of fitting in the yellow motor in there trying to gauge where it's going to sit and where, you know, how to hook it up. This other one, somebody I came across more recently, is uh, Danny Rowland. He's um, uh, one of the people at Misty Frog Acres in Washington. Um, he's got a little Power King, which was a nice little compact economy tractor that was made, I would say, in the 60s, 70s. Uh, I'm not sure, 80s. Uh, I'm not sure that when they ceased manufacturing, probably almost into the 90s, if not into the 90s. Um, great little tractor, very sturdy, durable, robust tractor. Um, he's gone the whole hog and he's putting these lithium 3.2 volt lithium batteries in his and this particular picture here is just he was just fitting to see how many I think there's 20 of them there but I think he said he's putting 23 in I'm not sure where the other ones are going but this is sort of mid mid job so um, I'm sure I'll keep up with him and uh, and uh, see how he's moving along on this project but you know give you an idea of just what um, you know what we're what options we have in, in the way of tractors. Uh, they don't have to be, oops, maybe I meant to, how am I going to get back to, I'll get back to something and see if we get some regular photo here. We had a loop going. Not 
sure what I did with all that stuff. Here we go. Nope. Yeah, this is a good one. Um, so at this point, um, I guess we can say the presentation itself is over, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. I see we've got a couple of things going on here. Let me take a look. Excuse me as I try to read this here. Um, I'm working, Scott says, I'm working on converting a, ro a rotor tiller to, into an old school two-wheel tractor. Well, there you go. And that's another, you know, we, um, we ourselves have a diesel-powered, uh, no, I'm not sure it's not diesel, it's the gasoline, I guess, um, uh, uh, kind of two-wheel uh, walk-behind implement, thing with implements. And um, that that functions fine, but I mean, it something like that, like a David Bradley or a two-wheel tractor of Sears or whatever, uh, whoever made them, I'm sure there's a number of manufacturers, um, they um, they would be an excellent conversion. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't require that much horsepower, so the motor doesn't have to be that, that large. And I am guessing that using lead-acid batteries with that might be a bit of a challenge just because of the pure size of them. However, if you could, um, you know, live with... Uh, you know, a reduced range or a reduced number of runs up and down the rows uh, before you charge it, that might be, you know, that might be an option. And in fact, you could probably get, you know, I know you could get, you get a, if you used a 220 volt charger, you could do a, a much quicker charge. So you wouldn't have to worry about waiting too long between, between uh, uh, uses when you're charging it. Um, so good luck on that project if that's what you're doing. Um, let me see what else we have here. Reading off this list. Uh, uh, cool. Let's see, rotor tiller. Um, carbon's good for the soil. Let me see. What would it, uh, Jared asked, what would it take to, for you to start manufacturing them or these tractors? How big is the market? How can I get involved? Well, we're not, you know, we're essentially just using this to, um, we're, we're doing this to put to use one of the three tractors we had and uh, essentially use it on a, a much less impactive mode of um, operation, which is, you know, electricity. Um, and also, I purposely kept it simpler and sort of old school and sort of golf cart technology because I, we wanted it to be replicable and duplicable by pretty much anybody. I mean, it really does not take, it's not that difficult. It, do, it does take some tools, it does take some welding and that kind of thing. But those jobs can be, a lot of the particular jobs can be just either farmed out or given or worked with a friend or something that has those tools. Um, so we really want to try to people to, to copy this and try to do it themselves. Um, but we, we have really have no plans at the moment to manufacture these, th these, uh, these, these things. Um, you know, I've often wondered why, I mean, a tractor doesn't have to look like a tractor. I mean, there's some, you know, people sort of get stuck on the idea of it has to look like a tractor and has to have the high hood and the four wheels the way they are and the, you know, the belly and all that kind of thing. But I, not, not necessarily has to be that way. But that, you know, I would think that maybe if people were going to go into manufacturing and they might take a step back and look at, at, what a tractor is supposed to do just as much as what a tractor is supposed to look like. Um, and, you know, the, the function really is, is really the key. So, um, you know, followed by expense and, you know, availability. Um, and that's the other thing with the, with the lead acid batteries and the golf cart technology. You know, golf carts have been around for a long time and they, at one point in their early lives, they were not nearly as good as they are today the components and the um, durability and the cost even, uh, all these components have improved vastly over the past, you know, five years even. So these components we're using here, even though the technology is old, the, the, the components are modern and effective and efficient compared to what was going on, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, I don't I feel a lot better about using a golf tar cart technology in this tractor as opposed to something more modern like, uh, I mean, some folks take a Nissan Leaf and strip it down to the chassis and pull the batteries out of the, out of the platform and, you know, maybe put the, a drive motor on each wheel. I mean, you can do all that, but, you know, this, you're not going to do it for the cost of the, 
of the tractor that we built. So, um, you know, that's sort of where, where the thinking came from on that. Let me see if you have any other questions on that. What's the amp draw? Jared also wants to know what's the amp draw in each gear. Um, essentially, um, well, I'll tell you to start the, um, to start the conversation of the, uh, the, uh, Amp draw is going to be about 50 amps um, on light use, and it'll do about 70 or so um, in, in working mode. I have pushed it all the way up to over 150 and to 200, uh, purposely climbing hills while you know putting the cultivators down or doing uh, uh, running in third gear and trying to go up you know up hills or whatever, uh, which it does extremely well. The, the torque in the motor is made for that. Um, let me just refer to my notes here. I, I had a, I think I had a, uh, I think I had some notes on here about what the, what the draw was in each gear. Um, may have been that. Excuse me. Oh, here we go. No, I don't. That's not it. Um, well, I'll explain it. Essentially, essentially, if you can, if you can keep your amp draws down. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Find that chart. That might be better. There it is. If you can keep the, if you can keep the amperage draws um, down, your horsepower is going to going to suffer a little bit. But uh, you don't really need it. If you keep the amp draws down and use use a lower gear. Um, you're going to be better off. And that's one of the reasons I actually have not finished um, have not finished testing all that stuff through all the gears, because I. Um, uh, just haven't had time to with the new cultivating bar to, to get all that done. It, it's winter now, but um, uh, the the torque the torque range can get even even with a six horsepower output in this thing. The torque can be up to over twenty. I mean, twenty foot pounds of torque is a lot for a six horsepower motor. So essentially, what I'm what I'm getting at is that let me get back to my original. What I'm getting at is that the um, is that the uh, transmission isn't even necessary. You can, you can bolt that motor directly to the front of the input shaft of the transmission. So that's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's like driving in third gear. And then you can, uh, and the motor is reversible, by the way. So, um, so you can use the electronic, use the electrical reverse as opposed to a manual shifting to go into reverse. Uh, so you'll have essentially the same speeds forward as you do backwards if you do it electrically. Um, but in third gear, if you if you remove the transmission entirely and just bolted it directly to the uh, uh, input part of the differential, you would gain another probably 12 to 16 inches and probably be able to strap some of those batteries, if not all in the back, if not all of them that were in the back, down underneath, give it a lower center of gravity and, and keep the weight distribution much more favorable. Um, I, I just didn't want to do it that way. I, I wanted to do it with the transmission because I just wanted to see what the amp pulls were in in each gear. And I can I can tell you that the of course as you go into the lower in first gear, it's going to be a lower amp draw to do the same amount of work than if you put it in second gear uh, and went faster. As you increase the speed of the motor, though, you know you pull your amps up, and so um, essentially using the gearing is going to be better as far as uh, con consumption, then using the gearing and keeping it low is going to be better in consumption than riding it in third gear all the time and just going that way, um, although it can be done very easily. The, mo the motor doesn't care. It's, it's very powerful. Uh, let me see if we have another question. Um, where, let me see. Where, uh, let me see, where can I? V. Cooper says, where can I locate the tractor to convert? How much do they cost? OK, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Actually, I wasn't involved in the original purchase of the tractors, but I think, I think somebody may have found them you know, in Craigslist or advertising or maybe through word of mouth and farm community. But the gentleman we bought them from had a, you know, a little collection uh, of, um, of uh, Alice G's and their, and their knockoff versions. Um, and we ended up getting three of them. I would imagine that just you know a Facebook Marketplace search, a Craigslist search, uh, go through some of the uh, agricultural um, 
groups on Facebook or some other platform, and you can maybe ask some questions. Um, there are some, uh, you know, DIY, do-it-yourself ag Facebook um, groups that possibly would, you know, have some input there. But, you know, really just word of mouth or just looking in the, in the classifieds or the, um, you know, the marketplace, whatever you, whatever you have locally to look at, um, you can get them. As I said, they're not, they're not like they're all over the place, but they're not all that rare because they don't, they don't um, fall apart. I mean, they're, they're substantial tractors. Just like you see Ford 8Ns or Massey Ferguson 30s all over the place because they don't break. I mean, essentially, they might need engine work, but they just don't break. So that's, you know, that's where, that's where I would go. Let me see if there's anything else on the uh, questions here. Um, and, and V. Cooper also asked, are you available to contact for questions when I'm putting this together? Um, and um, yes, yeah, we, we, Living Web Farms is, is definitely dedicated to helping out folks. I'm mean, up to a point, helping out folks with, um, you know, with your help and, and that kind of thing. I will post, uh, I didn't include, and I should, I don't know why I didn't, but I should have, uh, an access list for the end of this video. I should have put it in there. Uh, just sort of a reference for where to go for further information, maybe some websites, some books, uh, some uh, um, shopping, online shopping sites, that kind of thing. Um, and I will, I, I should put that together and just, I don't know if I can, I can post it on here and have them re, uh, yeah, we can do that. We can have them reset the video or I can just, I can also post it on, on our website under, um, uh, I forget what the title is there, but you drop down the menu and it says archived, I think it's, it's workshops, under workshops, you drop down and it says archived workshop handouts. And when we, uh, when we had in-person workshops, which we, I hope will continue um, uh, when the COVID situation has cleared up a bit, um, we uh, generally handed out to the attendees at the workshop, handed out uh, paper, um, two or three sheet paper or four sheet paper things um, that had, you know, a lot of that information right there and they could take it home with them, whatever. And then I ended up posting them, everybody ended up posting them on, uh, on the website so you could access it, anybody could access it uh, online after that point. So if there's any particular questions about, is this motor any good or what gauge cable should I use or, um, or is, uh, is this 200 amp controller enough for this or how heavy a battery should I, all that stuff. I, I, I could help you. Yes, you just email me at richard at livingwebfarms.org or go on the website and look for um, contacts and all that information will be there and you can, you can email me and we'll, you know, take care of that uh, to the extent that we can. Let me see if there's any other questions. Um, well, Rachel says, thank you for making a video about this topic. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm really wanting to do that. Um, and I, again, this is basically an entry level, simple economy, version of um, you know what we're doing so uh, you know we uh, you know we want to make it available to the public and um, you know that's where we're at so so I want to thank everybody who's in you know, showed up here for the webinar and um, as I said we can it'll be posted on our website at livingwebfarms.org uh, as well and we're also on the our YouTube channel and um, you know, if you uh, subscribe, we can, um, you know, help us out and help you out <clears throat> and, uh, you know, make it uh, accessible for everybody. That's, that's part of the part of the deal here is, is open accessibility. And um, I guess that's about it. So have a good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.